This is Jerusalem, the holy city. The day is the 5th of June, 1967. The time is 11 a.m. The sky is an enchanting sapphire blue, and from it a friendly but dazzling sun floods the entire city with a warmth and radiance which makes it a joy to be alive today. It seems almost a monstrous thought that at this very moment men are fighting and dying on the sands of Sinai. But in Jerusalem there is peace, and yet it's an uneasy peace. The roads are quiet, too quiet. Buses are few and far between. Some stores and workshops are open, others are locked and barred. Far fewer people than usual walk through Jerusalem's quiet streets. There is a tenseness you can almost feel, a waiting for something. Any loud noise jars your nerves now. The tenseness is real. It's all about you. It is quiet, too quiet. Then at about 11.25, The people shudder. They know what these sounds mean. They've heard them during 1939 to 1945 in Europe, in 1948 and 1956 in Israel. These are the machine guns and mortars which are chattering out the end of an era and which are at this moment wounding, perhaps killing their neighbors. But each one thinks perhaps it will be like Friday three days ago. Friday, when the Jordanian machine guns opened up at about noon, just about this time, and the firing lasted only seconds. Perhaps this is just like Friday. A few seconds, even minutes of firing, then quiet. But it is not like Friday, June 2nd. This is Monday, June 5th, and this is war. The war no sane person wants. Jerusalem has now begun her agony the most painful ordeal she'll face since the long siege of 1948, when the state emerged from a cauldron of fire. Some children, it is true, were dismissed from their schools hours ago. Their mothers clutch them now in panic and rush with them to the shelters, dodging bullets and shell splinters on the way. Other boys and girls are still in school and their mothers are frantically trying to get through on the telephone. The streets are deserted, except for civil defense volunteers and a few souls scurrying to shelters, peering in all directions for the sharp little bits of steel which cut and kill. There is no longer an uneasy quiet in Jerusalem. The city now knows that it is, once more, in the front line. Jerusalem turns on its radios, searching for some ray of hope, some reassurance. Perhaps the firing was, after all, a mistake. There is a lull in the shooting. But the war, by radio, continues. The martial music from Jordan is brazen and, after only minutes, unbearable. Even the old English hunting song, Do You Ken John Peel, is pressed into service by the Jordanians to grate on Israeli nerves. The seconds drag, the minutes crawl. Time does not exist. Has it been only minutes since the firing started? There's virtually no news from Sinai or any other front. And in Jerusalem, one could only guess as to where the Arabs, only hundreds of yards away for 19 years, have penetrated. The Jordanian music rasps on mercilessly. The Israeli reply is somewhat more restrained. Say, 
But at least the shooting has stopped. There is some hope in this, some possibility for... Even now, hearing the first firing in some moments, one clings to the illusion. The mind whispers that there is no hope, that blood must be spilled. Even as the heart warms to the idea of a lull, a mistake, a hurried ceasefire. Then the Jordanian announcer makes his threat, and with it, the last shred of illusion has been stripped away. Palestine, he promises in Arabic, will return to you with Allah's help. <laughs> The market for illusions has gone. Jerusalem, surrounded for 19 years on three sides by Arabs and accessible only through one corridor, is now free, free of illusions. This, he said, is a war for Palestine, and every man, woman, and child here knows precisely what that means and what the price of defeat will be. Then, on this lovely summer day, under an exquisite blue sky, in this marvelous city of ochre and pink stone, the holy city, a sincere, almost passionate voice enters their homes from Jordan. Brother citizens, brother Arabs everywhere, brothers in the Arab armed forces, brothers stationed on the long front line. The enemy this morning launched an aggression on our Arab land and airspace, on our airfields and cities. We were expecting this aggression. The Arab nation now stands in this battle of destiny united to face threats, to face the enemy in Israel and those who stand behind Israel. All our soldiers are in this battle, the battle of destiny, to defend our rights, to defend our land, to defend our honor. We are all soldiers and we are at the beginning of the decisive battle which has already started and we hope in the end it will carry victory. We have decided either to live in honor or die in honor in the defense of everything dear to every Arab. Cairo Radio announced that the United Arab Republic Air Force shot down 44 Israeli planes during the air raids launched by Israel on Cairo this morning. The radio said that this is the first sign of victory over the enemy. Cairo Radio broadcast a statement... Can it be true? Have 44 Israeli planes been destroyed? with 44 of the pick of Israel's youth, so soon, in just hours? But there's no time to think, to worry. Jerusalem must defend its people, its homes, all it has built up throughout the years. The radio calmly issues instructions in Hebrew for protection of their windows against bomb blast. <laughs> Worried about the possibility of its hundreds of thousands of Arabs in Israel being used as a fifth column, the Jerusalem radio warns Arabs not to move from their homes without special permission. Then all Israel tenses anxiously as more reservists are called. The men listen grimly to the code names for their units. Nine alternating current, ten inward parts. 11, open window, 12, faithful Jews, 13,
In every party, said George Eliot, there is an image of death. And throughout the land, fathers hug and kiss their children and promise that they will return soon. They kiss their wives, but make no promises and leave quickly, quickly. You can see them now on city streets, at crossroads, on dirt roads, in jeeps, buses, taxis, milk trucks. This is no spit and polish army. Most have no hats or helmets. Few have complete uniforms. There may be a khaki shirt or khaki trousers, but most of the time they wear ill-fitting clothes, put on hurriedly and with little concern for their appearance. These men, rushing to their units in the desert, the cities, the coastal plain, the hills of Galilee, are not really soldiers. They're bus drivers, clerks, cooks, mechanics, insurance agents, engineers, architects, shoe salesmen, dock workers, university students and teachers. They're anything but soldiers. And who, they would tell you, needs uniforms? They have no professional interest in war, no desire for anything but getting back as soon as possible to their families, their homes, their jobs, their problems, the real things. War is just a job, a dirty job, but one which has to be done. The Israeli's sense of humor does not desert him even now. A tired-looking old man, huddled with others in a depressing shelter, listens incredulously to an American march being played on coal Israel. Oh ho, he says to an eager group of listeners. Now, now, it's serious. First, only the Arabs were playing marches. Now, we're playing marches. This is bad, very bad. Much of Israel's population has come from the Arab lands, and many are even more familiar with Arabic than they are with Hebrew. Hungry, thirsty, sitting in dark, fetid shelters, cut off from news of their loved ones, with the enemy only seconds away, they listen to Jordan's next threat with horror. Today, says the voice from His Majesty King Hussein's domain, is the day of liberation. Arabs in Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, all of you run to the campaign of liberation. Sons of Egypt, sons of the Arabs, today attack, fight, kill, destroy. Jordan is now in a frenzy. Today, Jordan says, we shall show them what a fight is. All the Jordanian forces are fighting bravely with the armies of all our Arab brothers to crush the fortresses of the enemy. Even bagpipes are used by the Arabs. The effect is blood-curdling as the shrill notes echo throughout the shelters. Call Israel goes on its merry way. Then the young lady from Jordan, speaking earnestly and proudly, tells of more news from the front. To the Israelis listening, the news is all bad. Jordanian, Iraqi and Syrian Air Force are staging joint air operations and strafing targets inside occupied Palestine. Strafing is continuing. Jerusalem listens to the news grimly. The rumors, some of them accurate, fly into every shelter. The Israeli garrison on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem, completely encircled, is being shelled mercilessly. Can they hold out? And for how long? The Arabs have reported that the Haifa refineries are in flames. The Israelis deny this. Tel Aviv, they say, has been bombed ruthlessly, but this too is denied. The Jordanians are now confident of victory. <laughs> دائما 
الله أكبر الله أكبر والنصر لنا أجل يا أخي العزة والنصر لنا لأننا أصحاب Our motto is Allah is the greatest and victory is with us The time has arrived to teach you imperialists and Zionists a terrible lesson that you'll never forget Crush their den of treachery of sin of Zion The world thick with your treachery, you Shylocks. Now the world is closing in on you to give you the right punishments you well deserve. You have incurred the wrath of God on yourselves, O Israel. Prepare for your doom. But for those innocent men, women, and children living in our occupied homeland, we advise get out, leave before it is too late. Get out, leave, before it is too late. To Zionist oppressed people on the other side, do not be misled by your false propaganda. You have had it. Get out, for here comes the Arab firing squads of justice. يدك الأبطال في هذه اللحظات وكر الغدر والغدر Our brave men are now destroying the dens of treachery and thievery. Zainis, this is the beginning and the end. The armed march of the Arab nation advances from Jordan, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Algeria, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Sudan, Lebanon, Morocco, Libya, and the Gulf of the legions of the Arab people advance in a holy war to liberate our holy land, bearing the gift of death and the kiss of annihilation to whoever dares to resist. Jerusalem has now been shelled for hours. Bikur Holim Hospital in the heart of the city Shari Tzedek and the Hadassah Hospital in the suburb of Ain Karim receive a steady flow of the wounded and dying. The ambulances run through a gauntlet of fire to deliver their bodies. The fighting men wounded in defending this city, the civilians who could not escape enemy fire. The doctors, nurses, volunteers toil through the day and night in a twilight world of ether, drugs, pain, blood, hysteria, severed limbs, shock. There is no respite for the soldiers, for the doctors, for civilians in Jerusalem. There is no peace for the holy city. In Sanhedria, on the very outskirts of the new city, Men are killed for inches and yards of earth. An Israeli unit charges and loses 30% of its men. A Jordanian shell scores a direct hit and a three-man Israeli gun crew is wiped out in a flicker. This is a small country. You can drive in only a few hours from the rolling hills of beautiful Galilee to the stark sands of the Negev Desert. But this is for a future which seems far, far off. And if you survive, it's still a pleasant thought, especially when you can't sleep and you can feel the hatred reach out across no man's land. You people there in our occupied homeland, watch for the superb Red Cathayet soldiers of the Jordan Arab army. They're inspired by His Majesty's superb sense of strength. They'll stop at nothing. Strength and ingenuity. In houses and streets in occupied Palestine, they'll bring death and destruction to the Zionist criminals. We advise all those who do not identify themselves with the Zionist criminals to get out, where the getting out is easy. Jerusalem is now a city of peace. 
Even the machine guns and artillery gunners are deathly tired. The mortar crews seize a few moments of rest. The paratroopers try to stretch their limbs in narrow slit trenches. The city is black. A child wails somewhere in the blackness from a shelter. No noise, no light. The tall, tapering cypresses are silhouetted against a star-bright sky, and even death waits for a few minutes. Gunfire never discriminates. The luxurious, charming homes of Rochavia in Jerusalem's most expensive quarter are hit. The humbler flats of Nachalat Shimshon, Mea Sheyarim, and Musrara are destroyed. Rich or poor, fat or thin, old or young, the shells refuse to respect pedigree, economic status, or education. The list of wounded now runs into hundreds. It will eventually reach to more than 500. But Jerusalem does not know this as yet. The shell splinters and mortar bombs make a shambles of a library, collected in 10 different countries over a period of 25 years and brought to Israel under appalling difficulties. In a Masrara hovel, the pitiful sticks of furniture and the clothes accumulated by 10 years of toil are gone in seconds. This is the holy city, the city of David. Many years ago, a shepherd became a king and composed the immortal psalms treasured by all of mankind. Now, hundreds of generations later, one of his descendants, a bearded, bent old man with seven sons and grandsons fighting, sits in a Jerusalem shelter and chants the psalm of his ancestors. Be gracious unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. They that lie in wait for me would swallow me up all the day. In God, I will praise his word. In God do I trust. I will not be afraid. What can flesh do unto me? A tall infantryman leans against a wall, crying. The tears flow down a dirty, bearded face. Yesterday, he was a student at the Hebrew University, majoring in English literature. Today, he is a blooded soldier who has seen 20 of his friends, some he has known since they learned the ABCs of Hebrew together, killed before his eyes. He cries bitterly, and the others look away, ashamed. His sobs are terrible to hear. This is night in Jerusalem, the holy city, sacred to three faiths. This is the city for which men have struggled and for which they've given their lives for thousands of years. Somewhere in the night, the Hebrew news comes on briefly and is drowned out by the angry guns. The voice speaks of far-off lands, of the UN, of Russia, of the United States, of meetings, deliberations, solemn councils. Here in Jerusalem, men, women, and children die in mortar blasts by razor-sharp shrapnel and by the murderous bullets which splatter through streets and into homes. But at the beginning of this second day of this battle for Jerusalem, the melodies on Kol Israel seem a little brighter, a little happier. The shelter, dark, close, horrifying in the murky gloom, seems something you can almost get used to. Throughout the long, dark, sleepless hours, the machine guns, the mortars, the artillery shells, alternate with the music of Kol Israel. In a night 
unlike any other night Jerusalem has undergone since her agony of 1948. Birds of Israel are perhaps a special breed. Maybe they're descendants of the birds who sat through the 1948 War of Liberation here, the Long Siege. They live on seeds and worms and laugh at shells and water bombs. No amount of gunfire will stop them from singing in the pre-dawn hours. It's good to be alive on this day, on any day. In the shelters, in the hospitals, prayers of hope and of thanks are said to the accompaniment of gunfire. Many there are that say of my soul, there is no salvation for him and God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield about me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I lay me down and I sleep. I awake for the Lord sustaineth me. I am not afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. The Israeli army spokesman has announced the shelling of more settlements by the enemy. Mount Scopus in the old city is undergoing a pounding by Arab artillery. Villages in eastern Galilee are under Syrian fire. One flare after another tears open the sky over Jerusalem. The city, caught by the eerie orange-red glare, shudders, naked and terrified. Each soldier holds his breath, waiting for the next wave of shells to plummet down upon the gun positions which have been revealed. Then, at one point in the chilling pre-dawn hours, the all-clear siren, the most wonderful sound in the world to your ears, begins to wail. It's over. The war is over. No more shooting, no more killing. It's peace. Shalom. No more firing. But there is firing. It can't be. It's just a mistake. They can't fire during an all-clear. But the firing goes on. The siren continues its wail. And now you know there should have been no siren. It was a false alarm. There is no peace. The war goes on, even more hideous now that you've heard the siren, now that you've tasted, if only for a few seconds, the bliss of peace. But it is dawn, and you've survived another 24 hours. It's time to be grateful for your blessings, for the shrapnel which missed you, for the shells which fell yards away and spared your books, your records, and your pictures. And because there's another beautiful day outside, another day of life, another wonderful day. The Hebrew news comes on now at 5 a.m. and you learn from an army spokesman that 200 Egyptian tanks have been smashed in the Sinai Desert. Gaza has fallen, and the old city of Jerusalem is now encircled by Israeli soldiers. In Jordan, Israeli units have captured Kalkilia, Latrun, and Jenin, and reached the vicinity of the mountains of Samaria. The army denies that there is street fighting in the old city. Nebi Samuel has been taken. The fall of Ramallah seems near. In Sharei Tzedek Hospital, five civilians have died of their wounds. In Bikur Cholim Hospital, two civilians hit by shrapnel have died. At 5 a.m., two shells tear into the Sharei Tzedek, and Israel witnesses yet another miracle. One shell rolls into a storage space overlooking the corridor of the maternity ward. There are 12 mothers and babies in the corridor. Miraculously, the shell neither explodes nor rolls forward. 
and army engineers later removed and detonated. In the first few hours of the war, which began yesterday, 250 wounded have already been admitted to the Hadassah Hospital in a suburb of Jerusalem. Emergency teams are handling dozens of cases at a time. Those who are able to walk stumble about aimlessly in the corridors, some with their eyes closed, their faces covered with blood and dirt. A captured Arab legionnaire is brought in, badly wounded. A doctor says the only words he knows in Hebrew, which he said over and over when he came in, were, we are brothers, we are brothers. The news comes on in Yiddish. <laughs> A heavy Tu-16 Iraqi bomber has attacked the city of Netanya. A woman standing on the balcony of her apartment has been killed. Twenty-five others have been wounded. The Arabs are sure of victory. The radio in Egypt tells its listeners that Nasser's armies have penetrated deep into Israel, shelled dozens of Israeli settlements, and shot down dozens of Israeli planes. The Jordanians are told that scores of Israeli planes have been shot down and dozens of Israeli tanks destroyed. Amman Radio in Jordan proclaims, in the Holy Quran, Allah has equated the Haram a Sharif and the Holy Kaaba in Mecca. What is happening in Jerusalem today is thus a holy war for the Kaaba, for Mohammed. There will be a welcome in paradise for those who fall in this jihad. Call Israel's reply is unmistakable. It plays the March of the Toys. Syrians are told that many Israeli planes have been shot down, but that not one of their planes has been lost. And call Israel listeners hear a magic flute. Good afternoon, everyone. It's now 1.45 p.m. Israel time, 11.45 hours Greenwich Mean Time, and here is the news read by Ruven Morgan. First, the headlines. The Israel Air Force this morning destroyed eight Egyptian and seven Iraqi planes. One of them was an Iraqi plane which had attacked Netanya. In the Jerusalem sector, Israeli forces have captured the height of Nebi Samuel, the villages of Sha'afrat, Beit Iksa, and Latrun. The Foreign Minister, Abi Ibn, flew to Washington this morning for talks. Israel troops in the Jerusalem sector have been given detailed orders to safeguard the holy places of all faiths. The military spokesman announced this morning that in the early hours of today, four Egyptian Sokhoi 7 bombers were shot down by Israeli aircraft over Sinai. In addition, two more Sokhois and two MiG-21s were shot down by the Israel Air Force in the Sinai area between the hours of 10.15 and 10.30. Israel planes which went into action against the Iraqi Air Force Base H-3 destroyed six Iraqi planes. The raid on the H-3 base was ordered after an Iraqi bomber of the Topolev 16 type had been shot down whilst bombing the Netanya area. Our reporter there says that the plane bombed the town at 6 o'clock this morning, hitting buildings in the main street. A woman watching the air raid from her balcony sustained fatal injuries. 26 people were wounded, five of them seriously. Seven of the injured were sent to their homes almost immediately. <laughs> Bye, 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 bye,
In shelters, hospitals, homes throughout this city, the people of Jerusalem, only yards away from Jordan's soldiers and Jordan's guns, hear the conflicting claims of the Arab radio and call Israel. The streets are desolate. There is no communication, even with those a short distance away. Each shelter, each apartment is an island in itself. No one can really be sure as to what is happening. Radio Amman announces, more than 500 were killed and wounded when our artillery fire hit the Knesset building and the cabinet building in occupied Jerusalem. The bombardment of enemy positions is continuing. Call Israel concedes that a house in the vicinity of the prime minister's office has received a direct hit, that buildings in the area of the Knesset, including the Israel Museum, have been shelled, and that the Hebrew University and schools there have been damaged by Jordanian artillery fire. Israeli Chief of Staff Rabin tells a press conference our main thrust is against the Egyptian forces who have started this war. Rabin continues, I cannot say the battle is over. This is the war we are fighting against Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq. In less than three days, we have succeeded in dealing a fatal blow to the air forces of these four nations. Somehow, Jerusalem has lived through yet another night. It is now the third day of war. Amman Radio is still calling on the Jewish inhabitants of Jerusalem to surrender before it is too late. In the early hours of Wednesday morning, the Hebrew announcer tells Jerusalem, our holy places have been taken and we will never be separated from them again. Israeli troops attacking through St. Stephen's Gate at the northeastern corner and through Zion Gate at the southwest corner have now taken the old quarter of Jerusalem. The western wall of the ancient Temple Mount is for the first time in 19 centuries under Jewish control. As long files of Arab soldiers are led away as prisoners, Israeli troops, hungry, begrimed, exhausted, stream toward the almost legendary wall, which most of them have never seen, but which has been an ages old dream. Now, for the first time in 1,897 years, they pray at the wall, the first time since the overthrow of the temple by Roman troops in the year 70. Many put petitions for the health of their loved ones between the giant stones. Other battle-hardened troops stand in awe at this almost incredible wall, this dream of 19 centuries, the tears streaming down their cheeks. Now, for the first time in history, Call Israel gives the weather forecast for the newly captured Gaza Strip from 16 to 26 degrees centigrade. The Yiddish announcer, his voice betraying his emotion, tells his listeners, the ancient city of Jerusalem has been liberated today. I repeat, the ancient city of Jerusalem has been liberated today. The outstart from Jerusalem is heind befreit geworden. Mir chazern iber. The outstart from Jerusalem is befreit geworden.
war still grinds on, taking its toll. Three children are injured when they step on a mine in what was formerly no man's land, in the Rokhov Shmuel Hanavi area. Snipers persist in the old city, picking off their victims. The Mount of Olives still holds enemy machine gun nests. Radio Amman still warns that the Arab Legion artillery will destroy your city completely, that there is street fighting in every lane and every house in the old city, on every hill near Bethlehem and Hebron, where our soldiers are proving their solidarity. The BBC gives more up-to-the-minute news. Israel says her forces have penetrated into the Jordan Valley and taken Jericho and Bethlehem. She also claims to have captured a large part of the Jordanian army and an Iraqi army brigade. In a press conference, Brigadier General Mordecai Hud of the Israeli Air Force gives details of the destruction of 441 enemy planes. At 10.15 Wednesday night, after three days of war, Call Israel's English language broadcast sums up the day's news. The old city of Jerusalem has been liberated. Most of the Sinai Peninsula, including Shalom el-Sheikh, is in Israel's hands, as is most of the west bank of the River Jordan, including Jericho, Bethlehem, and the Etzion block. This was stated this evening by the Chief of Staff, Major General Yitzhak Rabin, when he summed up 60 hours of battle. The Air Force Commander, Brigadier Mordechai Hod, announced that 441 enemy aircraft had been... General Shlomo Gorin, Chief Chaplain of the Israeli Army, blows the shofar at the Western Wall surrounded by the troops who have captured this holiest of Jewish sites. <laughs> then, his voice breaking with joy, Goran chants, this year in Jerusalem, in ancient Jerusalem, this year, this hour, in Jerusalem. Shana, <laughs> 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 